Hi, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this concluding panel uh, of this year's uh, uh, Strauss, uh, Strauss Seminar on the future of the U.S. relationship with the Arab monarchies of the Persian Gulf. Uh, a word of background on the, on the seminar. Um, the seminar is uh, officially the Melville and Layla Strauss Class of 1960 uh, seminar, and um, Melville, or as we knew him, Mickey Strauss, was uh, a devoted alum of the college, a longtime member of the Dickey Center's Board of Visitors. Uh, he had uh, had a very su successful career on Wall Street and uh, decided uh, that he wanted to do something for uh, the Dickey Center that it would uh, help it as it sought to uh, uh, fulfill its mission of uh, being a uh, uh, responsive to the words of John Sloan Dickey, which are the, the world's problems are your problems. And so he said, uh, I want you to do a conference every year on some of the uh, really urgent uh, problems of the day. And um, we have been doing that ever since. Uh, Mickey passed away in 2014. Uh, we held our first uh, conference the following year at which we worked uh, together with uh, the United States Holocaust Museum to create something called the Early Warning Project, which is a web-based portal that uses highly sophisticated predictive modeling to uh, assess where, um, which countries in the world are at greatest danger for mass atrocities or genocide. And that uh, project uh, continues to thrive. We've had other ones on uh, the, uh, the um, lessons learned from the uh, uh, big earthquake in Nepal, as well as on the future of global health in an era of deglobalization. This year, we thought that it would be good to uh, uh, look uh, at the uh, region of the Persian Gulf, or if depending on your, where you sit, the Arabian Gulf, and um, think about uh, what the, our future would be with uh, in, in terms of the relationships between the United States and the uh, Arab monarchies of the region. And uh, I think the reasons for taking on that uh, subject are pretty abundantly clear. Um, we are living uh, not only on the precipice of a war with Iran, but also have been facing real challenges in our relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia in the era of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, there have been questions about some of the uh, uh, activities he's undertaken together with the Crown Prince of uh, the UAE. The area itself is deeply divided. Uh, those countries have been carrying out a blockade of uh, their neighbor Qatar. And um, uh, there, there's also been a lot of instability spilling over from that region. Uh, we began the uh, session, we began the conference as we'll begin this with a discussion of uh, the energy background, which is really uh, essential to understanding any, uh, any part of our historic engagement in that region and how it has been changing. Uh, we had a really distinguished crowd of, uh, I believe, 16 participants. Several are here in the audience, several are up front. Uh, and I will uh, introduce them, and then we will go through some of the uh, things we discussed and, and, uh, um, and some of the problems we identified going forward. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Ambassador Ann Patterson. Ann has had uh, an incredibly distinguished career in the U.S. Foreign Service. Um, most, for most uh, people who make ambassador, one uh, post is a, is a huge achievement. Ann had five. Uh, I have to see if I can remember them all now. Guatemala? No. Colombia? El Salvador, sorry. El Salvador, Colombia, uh, Egypt, Pakistan, and which one am I missing? The UN. Um, and in addition, she was twice Assistant Secretary of State for first for um, international narcotics and law enforcement and uh, later for uh, Near East uh, affairs. Uh, next to her is uh, Jeff Feltman, um, uh, another old friend who was, uh, he's become a frequent visitor to Dartmouth. He's probably wondering why. Uh, but uh, he was here uh, during the winter, and he was also Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Near East. He was also Ambassador to Lebanon. And um, until uh, just a few months ago, he was Undersecretary General of the United Nations for Political Affairs. 
to his left is Jason Bordoff. Jason was senior director at the National Security Council, also the National Economic Council, and the Center for, and the NCEQ as well. At a different time. Okay. He's had more jobs than you can shake a stick at. Um, for energy and climate, um, Jason uh, uh, served in that position uh, at the NSC uh, through uh, 2013 when he moved to Columbia University and he founded uh, a center on global energy policy at, the, um, at Columbia's uh, School of International and Public Affairs. Um, and um, uh, they are just three of the stars we had here, but we, I'm delighted that they agreed to stay a little later and, uh, and to talk about what it is we um, discussed in this conference. What I'd like to do is start off with uh, Jason, and uh, uh, he can give you a bit of the background on the, on the energy situation. Your, are the slides loaded? Do you want me to use them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, we, we like to show people we can do the show and tell thing. Is there a thing? There we go. Here's a clicker. Um, well, thanks to all of you for being here. Pretty impressive in late June. I think if we tried to do an event at Columbia in late June, there'd be three people there. Um, so thanks for coming, and thanks to Dan for organizing it. It's great to be uh, back here at Dartmouth. As you heard, I teach at Columbia now. I'm wearing a vest that says brown on it because that's where I went to school. Uh, but I was married in Rollins Chapel. Uh, so it's nice to be back uh, on campus. Um, haven't been back too much since then, nearly two decades ago. Um, so uh, this is, there's a lot of expertise in the Gulf Arab region of the world on this panel. Uh, in, in the audience, people like Greg Gauss, who like the first person I would call to ask about a lot of these things. Maybe he'll come and sit up here at some point. Um, but my focus is energy, uh, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about the implications of issues in energy for issues of geopolitics and national security. And so I'm going to just spend, what do you want, like eight seven minutes, minutes, seven minutes? minutes? Okay. Uh, just doing two things. One is how has the energy situation changed in the last decade? And then a couple of thoughts, which we can get more, more into, and we talked a lot about the last day and a half about what they mean for the Gulf Arab region of the world. So you have all heard there's something called the shale revolution. Uh, I think it is as, as, as much hyperbole as used, is as used to describe it is warranted. Well, the US is now the largest producer of oil in the world. The US is the largest producer of gas in the world. This is a stunning turnaround from where the United States was 10 years ago and where everybody thought we would be. You just don't see a slope of this steepness very often in almost anything in the energy sector. You think about how big the energy system is, how much capital it takes, how slowly it changes to see the US go from importing 60% of its petroleum to next year we will be a net exporter of petroleum is a stunning turnaround that very few people saw coming a decade ago. We've seen almost a steep rise in our natural gas production. And you can see here our imports 10 years ago, and next year we will be a net exporter of petroleum. That masks the fact, and this is important for the Gulf, for things like President Trump's tweet a day or two ago that we don't care about the Strait of Hormuz anymore, uh, that net number masks very large flows. So it's on a net basis, but we're importing a lot and we're exporting a lot. And you can see here how much crude oil we're exporting. You can see here that broken out, the red line is net petroleum imports. But you can see the light blue, which is how much oil we're importing. That hasn't fallen that much. What's changed is that we're exporting a lot more oil, and especially we're exporting a lot of refined petroleum products. So nobody uses oil. They use gasoline and diesel. A decade ago, we were the largest importer of gasoline and diesel in the world. Today, we're the largest exporter of gasoline and diesel. So we're taking oil from the world in and manufacturing, in a sense. We're turning it into the stuff people want and then exporting that stuff. The amount we're actually importing physically from the Gulf uh, is down, but not dramatically. So we are still importing a lot of oil from a region of the world that we'll spend time talking about and as much in the news today. You can see we've had a lot of volatility in oil prices recently. Um, this is important for a couple of reasons, um, but I think this dramatic decline in 2014 in, the, in, in oil history, this is one of the steepest declines we've seen. There were a number of factors for that, but I would say the primary factor was U.S. shale production. The fact that the U.S. put so much additional supply in the market when it did was not the only, but the primary driver of this dramatic decline. We talk a lot about oil when it comes to the Gulf, and I just want to mention quickly that we shouldn't forget natural gas, which is important to the Gulf, especially a country like Qatar. And you can see on the left here, 
the projection from 2005 from the US Department of Energy for how much natural gas the US would need to import in the years to come. And you can see the most recent projection on the right for how much natural gas we are going to import. And now we are, it's, it's a mirror image. We're now gonna be one of the largest exporters of natural gas in the world. Again, just a stunning turnaround from where everybody thought we would be a decade ago. And the, the takeaway from this slide is we're gonna have a lot more gas <laughs> than, than we can consume domestically because when you produce oil, you often get associated gas with it. You're getting gas whether you want it or not. Your choices are to flare it, find something to do with it domestically, or else you have to export it. We're not gonna have enough uh, to do to export it. And that gas is very different from the other kinds of natural gas that have been sent into the global market. It's much more flexible. Um, not, doesn't have destination clauses on it. It's indexed to a hub price. So it's having an important effect that I'll talk about in a minute and how it's changing the global gas market. Um, I'll skip that. Okay, so what is all of, so a lot more gas, a lot more oil, big exporter. What does that mean for the Gulf? Well, one thing is when you drive an oil price collapse, you have a negative impact on economies in the Gulf that depend on oil primarily for their revenue. And you can see here the change in GDP and some of the ones most negatively affected, Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait. This shows you the price per barrel of oil according to the IMF these countries would need to balance their budgets. And we are not at these levels today. We're about $65 a barrel today. Oil at some point fell to 27. Recently it was uh, in the 40s before it came back. And the consequence of that are pictures like this. So this shows the fiscal situation in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the last few years. You can focus on this one as an example where you see the fiscal surplus or deficit back against the oil price. And so there's been a lot of talk of Vision 2030 of Saudi efforts to reform their economy. We could talk a little bit, and Greg will have good thoughts on this, about what progress they've made. There has been some, but it's been very challenging. It hasn't changed the fundamental dynamic that the state of the Saudi economy, like many economies in the region, is still very, very linked to what happens to uh, oil and gas prices. Um, all of that said, the, the, the takeaway, the, the point of this slide is to say that when oil prices were rising, it still took OPEC making a decision to put more oil in the market to keep them from going up further. And when they fell into the 30s, it took OPEC cutting production to stabilize them. So the idea that OPEC doesn't matter anymore, I think is wrong. We have still seen that within certain bounds, OPEC decisions do matter to stabilize prices. And OPEC is not the same as shale. Uh, shale is short cycle supply. Shale oil can ramp up and down more quickly for reasons we can talk about. It can't do that. It can't, Saudi Arabia went from, it increased and decreased production one and a half million barrels a day in a matter of two months, and then it brought it back down again a million and a half barrels a day in the, sp in the span of 60 days. Other sources of supply can't do that. So if you want a market balancer to deal with problems that happen in the Strait of Hormuz or somewhere else, uh, the spare capacity that is largely held by Saudi Arabia is still sort of unique in the global picture. And that matters to the United States um, because the prices that we pay at the pump are still linked to the global price, whether we're importing or not. Um, so that's one implication. The, the, another implication is the, 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 the extent to which shale has softened oil prices, in my view, has made it much easier to think about using foreign policy tools like sanctions against countries like Venezuela and Iran. When I was in the White House and we designed sanctions against Iran, oil prices were $120 a barrel. And the question was, how do we pull Iranian supply off the market without causing everyone to pay huge amounts at the pump? That's a very different discussion today. And it's kind of remarkable that we're taking Iranian oil off the market much more than people thought the US could do unilaterally by pulling out of the Iran deal crisis in Venezuela, you know, ships being attacked in the Strait of Hormuz, and oil is $65 a barrel, uh, which is still, historical standards, pretty cheap. But as I said, the price you're paying at the pump still reflects the world price of oil, whether, and that, and that happens regardless of how import dependent you are. We know that because every time the price of oil goes up, President Trump calls on OPEC on Twitter to boost supply, and he still has to do that, even though we're importing basically no oil today because the price of the pump is still going up for all the consumers. Um, so that, these is a summary of what I think the key 
oil, the, the key impacts in the Gulf region are from the shale oil revolution. Uh, we've pressured producer economies. It's made it harder for OPEC to balance the market because every time OPEC tries to cut production and push up prices, U.S. shale can just start growing again much faster rate within six to 12 months. So that makes it more difficult to think about how you want to push up prices. Um, we're starting to have a different diplomatic dialogue now from a consumer to producer one to a producer to producer one when you're the largest producer in the world. That has implications, I think, diplomatically we can talk about offsetting the market impact to make it easier to impose sanctions. It also just changes the perception, whether it's true or not, the perception in the US of energy independence means Congress feels more comfortable doing things like selling off the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We've now sold half of it in the last few years to pay for things that have nothing to do with energy um, because we feel like we don't need it as much. Again, I think that's not correct for the reasons I showed you uh, a minute ago. And it is true that from a GDP standpoint, the US economy is more insulated against oil price shocks than it was before. So consumers will still pay more at the pump, but increasingly that, that, that results in flows that transfer to domestic producers, not overseas. And that means that the impact, negative impact on GDP of an oil price spike or the positive impact of GDP of an oil price fall is much smaller now than it was in the past, even though, again, consumers, which are a political issue, are still impacted. Um, we could talk a lot about natural gas, it's just to save on time, I won't go into that too much now, uh, except to say a, a, a decade ago everybody thought the U.S. was going to importing, importing huge amounts of liquefied natural gas. Most of that was projected to come from Qatar. Now the U.S. is going to be one of the largest producers in the world. And the, so A, we're not, so all of that Qatari supply that we thought was going to come to the U.S. had to flow elsewhere into the global market. Then the U.S. in the last few years has started to put its own supply into the global market, and that has led to what you see on the right, which is we've created much more competitive pressure in the global gas market. When I was in the White House, you know, Prime Minister Abe, if he had 30 minutes with the president, when can we get your natural gas would be one of them, because he was paying $18, $20 per million BTU to import natural gas linked to the price of oil, and they wanted cheaper energy. The U.S. shale revolution has not by itself, but been an important contributor to helping to create a more competitive, integrated global gas market that actually delivers a lot of energy security to allies around the world. We did a study in, in December of what the impact of US LNG has been on Russia's gas policy and foreign policy. And you can clearly see how Gazprom is behaving more like a market actor today, responding to competitive pressures in its supply to Europe, and has much less leverage over the European market than it did a decade ago. And the US, again, is not the only factor, but an important factor uh, in that. And you can see over the years to come, we're going to see much more natural gas that's traded on the water, so meaning it's more flexible. It's easier to move a tanker around. A pipeline is point A to point B. That's it. And ships can go anywhere. They create a more competitive dynamic where market signals can determine where the supply of the energy goes. That's going to happen, and the US is going to be, be a big piece of that. And the other consequence of the U.S. Uh, in boom in uh, oil and gas, especially gas, has been, as it relates to the Gulf, uh, a little bit of geopolitical competition for who's going to put capital into the U.S. and show how much money they're spending in this country. The president likes highlighting how much money people are spending in this country. And so we saw just in the last few months, both Saudi Aramco and Qatar announce multi-billion dollar deals. And I think we'll see more of these to come into, into U.S. Uh, oil and gas, which again is sort of unthinkable like a decade ago that the places we were getting our energy from are now going to be investing billions of dollars in our ability to produce and export oil and gas. Um, I'm just going to wrap up by commenting on the fact that when we talk about the Gulf, we often talk about oil and gas. We should not uh, ignore climate change. <laughs> we should not ignore the need for an energy transition. Um, and this just shows you the International Energy Agency's projections on what would happen if we met the roughly two degree target uh, that countries agreed to in the Paris Agreement. You can see we use much less coal. We also use less oil at the top. We use, still use a lot of natural gas for a long time to come, although less than we would otherwise. So obviously, if we got on track with our climate goals, and we are nowhere close to on track today, emissions went up last year at the fastest rate since 2011, by the way. They're not even, not only are they not going down, they're increasing at a faster rate. So we're going in the wrong direction. But if we went in the right direction, that would have important economic and geopolitical implications for the Gulf. I will just say that this is much harder to do than I think the ambition and the level of hyperbole and rhetoric sometimes suggests. So I'll just 
try to demonstrate that with one last slide, which is on the top here. You can see what I think is often have people have in mind when they refer to a clean energy transition. They think about the energy transitions we've seen throughout history. We got all of our energy from wood, and then we got a bunch of it from coal, and then oil and the gas, and then recently it's been renewables. You can see these big shifts over time where we move from one source of fuel to another as a share of the total. The planet doesn't care about shares of the total. The planet cares about total tons of greenhouse gas. And what you see on the bottom is that same chart, not as a share of the total, but in total metric tons of energy. And you can see we've never used less of anything. So while the share of the total is changing, energy transitions in the past have been energy additions. They haven't been transitions. They've meant we've added to the stack and met growing incremental energy demand from new and different and increasingly clean sources of energy. And that's great. But you know, what would, if history is any guide, what, the, what, what an energy transition would mean from this point forward is the new growth in energy demand is met through zero carbon sources, hopefully. But what has to happen to deal with climate change is not only that, we have to eliminate <laughs> what you see there in blue and white and gray, which is something on the scale of historical you know, energy system transitions we've never seen before. So maybe that provides a bit of comfort to some of the Gulf states that are dependent on these revenues. Uh, this is really hard to do, and we're not anywhere close to where we need to be yet. So look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Right, so we could discuss the uh, implications of uh, all those facts and figures uh, for quite a long time, but we have a lot else to cover. It's against this backdrop that we discussed um, the appearance uh, on the scene of um, the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, it's important to under underscore that um, prior to uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the ascendance of his father, Salman bin, uh, bin Abdulaziz, um, Saudi Arabia had pursued an extremely uh, low-key, almost anonymous, uh, very um, uh, discreet foreign policy. It had tried to um, affect world events, often by writing checks. When um, uh, King Salman's predecessor, King Abdullah, um, uh, finally loosened up things up and was prepared to take a, a seat on the uh, Security Council at uh, the UN, he, uh, he woke up one morning, looked around, saw uh, just what a mess Syria was in particular, but the world in general, and then thought about um, Saudi Arabia having to uh, cast votes on issues uh, related to many of these different uh, subjects and decided better of it and did something that I don't think anyone else has ever done, which is uh, actually withdraw uh, and just uh, not take a seat on the, um, on the Security Council. Well, by contrast, uh, Salman came in, quickly elevated his son, uh, who, um, uh, as defense minister, was the architect of Saudi Arabia's uh, ill-advised campaign in uh, in Yemen. Um, you know, in not particularly uh, chronological order, he orchestrated um, essentially an anti-corruption drive that involved a shakedown of some of the wealthiest people in the kingdom for 100 or 150 billion dollars. They had they were incarcerated in the Ritz in Riyadh. Um, which is not typically how um, uh, anti-corruption drives go, but um, this was unique. Uh, he was involved in essentially kidnapping the prime minister of Lebanon in uh, the hope of uh, uh, affecting the politics in that country. Uh, everyone here, I'm sure, is familiar with the, uh, the murder of uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, the, uh, the journalist, um, and there are any number of other uh, um, things that he has done that I think uh, have really been stunning, uh, certainly uh, completely out of keeping with uh, the Saudi past. And um, I thought maybe I would then turn it over to uh, Jeff, who could talk a bit about uh, the thinking in the room and his own impression since he's met uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, and the kind of uh, the tenor of the conversation about what, what to, to paraphrase uh, you know, the sound of music, what do you do with a problem like Mohammed? <laughs> yeah. um, thanks, Dan. Thanks, thanks for um, inviting me to to this public public session. I appreciate having the, the chance to have these exchanges. 
um, with more than just the 16 people you assembled um, for the past two, past two days. I mean, to reinforce what you said, when I was Assistant Secretary of State in the job that Ann had after I did, and we were dealing with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia was cautious, um, passive, quiet, um, opaque. It was, it was difficult for us as U.S. officials to try to figure out what was really happening in Saudi Arabia and how to try to persuade Saudi Arabia to work with us on certain, on certain initiatives. I mean, we tended, you know, it, it, it was different than, the, than, our, than our friends or, you know, our, our strategic friends, our technical friends elsewhere in the Arab world, which, where you had much more of a chance to sort of brainstorm, compare notes, um, try to figure out where there were shared interests to try to promote them. Um, with, Saudi, with Saudi Arabia, it was very, very tough because of this very quiet, passive approach that they, that they took, low pro, very, very low profile. And now it's dramatically different. Um, Saudi Arabia, probably more than any other Arab country, is setting the agenda um, for, the, for the region. And that, of course, has a huge impact on U.S. policies. I mean, one could say that Mohammed bin Salman has been um, um, uniquely, uniquely successful in producing the opposite results intended. Um, <laughs> The, the Yemen war has resulted in greater Iranian influence than was there before. The Yemen war has resulted in the Houthis having a higher military sophistication than they, than they had before. The murder of Jamal Khashoggi, who was a, a critic of some of the internal policies, has focused more attention on the internal policies of, of, Saudi, of Saudi Arabia. Um, the, the kidnapping of the Lebanese prime, prime minister, which was, which was meant to rally people against Hezbollah in some logic has in fact united the country, united the country in Lebanon in a, in a very unique way. The Ritz-Carlton shakedown um, led to capital flight and the decline in foreign direct investment. You could say that he's been uniquely, as I say, uniquely successful in producing the opposite results intended. But um, I, I defer to some of the, the real Saudi experts in this room, which I'm not. I'm, I've, I've looked at the region more than concentrated on any particular country. but. He has made dramatic changes in Saudi Arabia. Um, the, the fact that, that we now look to Saudi Arabia as the agenda, as the primary setter of the agenda in the Arab world is a significant change. You know, Egypt, the traditional leader, is way behind. Egypt is, is a, um, you know, historically, has, historically, and still considers itself to be the leader of the Arab world, it's not. You know, it's, it's the Gulf, the center, the gravity, financial, Political security is the Gulf and now Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Inside Saudi Arabia, the, the, ref, the social reforms he's taken, the, the opening up of the, of the kingdom for entertainment, um, for, for, more, for sports, for, all, for movies, for all these sorts of things, um, has changed the atmosphere inside Saudi Arabia. And whether we, whether we like it or not, I think he's there to, he's, he's there to stay. Um, and what else, what else, the other things that he's done is he's, he has changed, obviously he has the support of his father, and his father is still the king, and his father um, just recently showed that he um, could handle three back-to-back -back summits in Saudi Arabia. Um, so I think that the, the, the rumors that the king is simply not there, just a facade, aren't true. The, the king has, has, has has set policies in certain areas, Jerusalem being being one of them. But but. Mohammed Salman has centralized power in a way that also changes the internal governance <clears throat> situation of the kingdom. You know, the, as, as you all know, the, the, the previous kings after the founder, Abdulaziz bin, um, um, Ibn, Ibn Saud, all the kings after the founder were, bro were, were half-brothers. They were the sons of the founder. Mohammed Salman is the next generation. But the the various branches of the family would tend to get strong governance or would get the Ministry of Defense or would get the Ministry of Interior. There would be centers of power that would satisfy other parts of the family. That's all been undermined by Mohammed bin Salman. So he's changed the nature of the governance inside the country to be far more centralized than it, than it was before. Um, and, of course, he's changed the social structure. Now, along the way, you could say he must have made many enemies. You know, the, the traditional business elite, who the people who were locked up in the Ritz or who knew people who were locked up in the Ritz, um, might not have appreciated that. You could say that the royal family, seeing how he's usurped power centers that were, that were traditionally part of the other, of the other um, parts of the family, 
They might not like that when they realize that they're probably going to be marginalized henceforth. Um, the clerics, as he's loosened the social controls, um, allowed women to drive, may not be very happy. I, I do not see these forces um, coming together in any kind of way that, will, that would ultimately derail um, his, his ascendancy to the crown eventually, but his power um, right now for a variety of reasons. There's divisions between them. They would be strange bedfellows. And I think he's proven how far he will go in, in centralizing power, stifling dissent, um, you know, et cetera. The Khashoggi, the Khashoggi murder, the Risk Carlton, those, those were messages that people would have received um, and understood inside the kingdom. Moreover, these social reforms that he's done are popular. We don't know, you know, I, I said at the beginning, Saudi Arabia was cautious, passive, opaque. It may not be cautious and passive anymore. It's still opaque. We still don't know exactly what people think. There are no opinion polls that we know. But it seems as though that the reforms that he's taken um, in terms of the entertainment, women driving, et cetera, are popular. So he, is, he has, in a way, protected himself from, from outside forces that might be opposed to him by, by adopting measures that are popular among the basic population. Saudi Arabia is like 27, 28 million people, most of whom are young, and they like the, 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 more, the more openness. Um, so I think, that, um, I think that he's there to stay, um, I don't think that we need to embrace him with great love, given what, he, given what, he's, given what he's done and the, the, um, the, the actions he's taken. The, the, in the meetings I've been with him, he has a very, very strong view of Saudi Arabia's um, role in the region, Saudi Arabia's role in, in Islam, Saudi Arabia's role in the world, and his ability to reach, to help Saudi Arabia reach the potential for those roles that I described. He has a very strong sense of his own destiny and of his country's destiny if he's, that, that he himself will lead. Um, and we have enough interest still in the Gulf that I think we have to find, we have to find ways to work with him and the country, um, but not so much where we have to abandon all of our own all of our own principles and ideals. As you were describing him, I was thinking that uh, I think he aspires to be Saudi Arabia's Peter the Great. You know, he really wants to um, both modernize it, but also uh, keep it as an absolute monarchy and patrimonial state. So it's a, it's a paradox uh, in in modern times. Um, and um, do you want to talk a bit about both uh, some of the thoughts that are circulating regarding how to uh, deal with um, Mohammed bin Salman, but also about some of the things that are perhaps less known uh, and uh, the way that the competition within the Gulf is spilling over into uh, uh, neighboring areas? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank everyone for coming. I hadn't been here in many years. Um, and it's, and it's great to be back. So we spent a lot of time talking about Saudi Arabia because it's essentially the big boy on the block. And, and we should spend some time on some of the smaller countries, but really it is the driver for the region. And I think the bottom line here is despite the unpredictability of this young kid, and remember how young he was when he came on the scene? He was like 30 years old. He'd never been outside of Saudi Arabia. He didn't speak English. He had huge blind spots about the rest of the world. Um, it's still a hugely important strategic interest for the United States because we may not depend on their oil supplies as much as we used to, but frankly, everybody else depends on what comes out of those choke points. Our allies in, in Korea and Japan and the UK are dependent on gas from Qatar. It's very, it still remains a strategically important uh, area of the world for the United States, and it still lives really under the U.S. defense umbrella. There is no other way to put it. We have when I was in government a few years ago, we had 38,000 uh, people in the Gulf. We have bases in Qatar, Bahrain, and Kuwait. And we protect these shipping lines as an element of national power, as an element of national power, and to protect our allies. So what matters in Saudi Arabia matters a lot to us, I think. And, and so 
we're very unnerved, frankly, in the U.S. government and sort of the policy community about how do we handle this kid who came from nowhere and does a lot of stupid things. Um, well, one way we handle him was we finally got an ambassador out there named General Abizade, who I would be very, I, I would bet my bottom dollar is not going to take a lot of um, lip from this kid. And, and he's going to have a, he's going to have, he's not going to bully him, I don't think, but he's also going to explain to him how the world works and how the, the, the international community perceives him. There are things he could do. He could certainly work on a settlement in Yemen. Uh, he could release the women drivers that he's locked up for some incomprehensible reason to us, but to him he sees them as a separate voice uh, about uh, as, and potentially separate uh, power center. We could reduce our arms sales. Um, that's going to the Congress has already voted to do that. I think the president will veto it. But we're pumping a lot of equipment into these countries, all of them, not just Saudi Arabia, that they can neither man nor maintain. Uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but I think it's going to be a combination of, of tough love and, and uh, uh, persuasion and just working on this. I agree he's going to be around f for a long time. And, and that bugs Americans because basically what happened to Jamal Khashoggi was just a cold-blooded cold murder, a gruesome murder where they chopped up the pieces of his body and threw them in an oven. So it's, I think it's hard for Americans to accept that we have to, and certainly we, we talked about the politics of this, it's hard for Americans to accept that we have to work with this, this young man, but there's really no way to get rid of him, and there's really no way that we can lower the importance of Saudi Arabia. Now, there's a big debate, we talked about this in the Department of Defense, to focus on great power competition, that our real competition now is a resurgent Russia and, and, and China, and that we need to get our resources out of the Gulf to focus on these other threats, which will require a massive sort of recasting of our defense capabilities. Uh, I think that's premature, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Uh, Middle East will draw you back in whether you want it or not, and we'll have to have some presence there. So there are things we can do to influence his behavior. Uh, but we're not going to dramatically change the human rights picture in Saudi Arabia, and I would fear that we're not going to really change the strategic role and the strategic importance of Saudi <coughs> Arabia. We just got to work through issues like this sort of day by day. Do you want to go into the Sudan, Libya? So we, we spent a very – this I was in Egypt, and we spent a long time at, at the conference talking about – it's not just Sunni Shia. There's a huge division within the Sunni world about how to treat political Islam. And most Americans know about that as they call it the Muslim Brotherhood. But it's a much broader movement of Islamists and, and their president in Jordan, Morocco, Yemen, uh, certainly Lebanon, Jordan. So, but the Saudis in the UAE fear that political Islam, they fear it's a political threat. And they're not wrong about that. Because when you scratch the surface in all these Arab countries, in my view, the only organized political movement or activity is usually the Islamic one. And that's in some respects because they haven't allowed more secular movements to, to arise and to flourish. But nonetheless, that's a, the that's a story. The Turks, the Qataris, mostly the Turks and the Qataris, but others, see that these Islamists aren't going anywhere, that they're going to have to make their peace with them, that they give them money and work with them closely. So these two schisms have really influenced the development in the Arab world in the past 10 years. It was very dramatic in Egypt, where when the Muslim Brotherhood elected President Morsi, when the country elected President Morsi, who was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, the, the Saudis and the Emirati poured a huge amount of money in uh, to get rid of him and 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 help. They certainly weren't the old factor, foment a coup. So this has played out in Sudan. It's played out in Libya. It's played out in Yemen, where basically these sides have dueled uh, on the on the role of political Islam. And we debated at this at this seminar at this conference how important that was. And I think most people think it's pretty important that this is a fundamental, different way of looking at the world uh, for our Sunni friends. 
and it's going to take a very long time for this uh, rift to heal. When they kicked Qatar out of the Gulf Cooperation Council, Qatar is the world's largest supplier of natural gas and is going to reinforce its position as the world's largest supplier of natural gas and when it expands its capacity. Um, Qatar didn't really suffer, not very long. There were some family issues and such, but, but economically it really didn't suffer greatly. Uh, but the U.S. suffered because the U.S. had always seen the Gulf Cooperation Council as the backbone of the U.S. presence or a huge aid for the U.S. presence in the Gulf. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of fissures in the Middle East that have nothing to do with us uh, and have to do with how they see the world. And it's very difficult to see how those are not going to play out in a bad way for the foreseeable future. So um, there were many, many other subjects we discussed, but I think the one that uh, um, is probably of greatest interest um, uh, to all the folks here, um, as well as to us, quite frankly, is the tension in the Gulf right now. Um, and uh, we did talk about, uh, and it's worth mentioning in passing, how a lot of the other parties in the region are affected by um, the, uh, the rise of Mohammed bin Salman and uh, Saudi Arabia's new look and um, uh, issues such as that. One of the interesting things that we discussed was um, the hopeful situation, I guess because it's hopeful we don't hear about it, uh, hopeful situation in Iraq, which recently had elections which went uh, um, uh, in a way that most people didn't think were going to turn out well. Um, that is, the results weren't that good, but in the end, the, the government that was uh, um, uh, was was put together, a uh, coalition government that was put together is actually extremely pro-Western. We were fortunate to have Brett McGurk, who was the longtime envoy uh, for Iraq, for the also for the coalition against ISIS uh, at the uh, at the conference, and he discussed that. One of the things that would really threaten that development is, of course, uh, a, um, an honest to God hot war in in the Gulf between the United States and Iran, and um, uh, we had a whole group of Iran experts and um, military experts, including former, uh, the former commander of CENTCOM, Joe Votel, and um, I would have to say it was a pretty depressing conversation um, because, uh, try as we might, um, we had a hard time finding any diplomatic off-ramps from where we are uh, now. Uh, you know, the President did something um, that I think a lot of us are pleased with in uh, not going through, whether he pulled it back or stopped it. He's been instructing us a lot through tweets on the appropriate nomenclature for this, but just not attacking uh, Iran uh, several days ago. Uh, and that's all great, but um, the conflict is essentially frozen. And uh, neither side has shown any great ingenuity in terms of how to get to the table. Maybe, Jeff, do you want to? talk a bit more about uh, the situation as you see it? I, mean, I think it's deep. I mean, the situation is deeply worrying. Um, I, you know, the, the, risk of the risk of miscalculation, the risk of misinterpreting um, incidents, the risk of misinterpreting others' intentions, um, those risks are high um, when there's absolutely no viable ongoing chain of communication, which there's not right now between, the, between um, Washington and Tehran. I think that the, 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 the you know, while we can, what, quote Churchill and saying, Jaw Jaw's better than World War, um, I think that the, the current level of rhetoric between the two, it reminds me of the, of the fire and fury and dotard exchanges about mm -hmm. North Korea of a couple of years ago, but the current level of, of rhetoric um, isn't a shooting war, but it doesn't help because it can, it can again, it can, it can leave the impression um, that, would, that, the, that one side or the other will misinterpret the intentions or misinterpret an incident leading to miscalculations, leading to escalation. I think so far the Iranians, um, I, think all of us, I think all of us in the room agree that the Iranians are the authors of these, of these incidents that we've seen against the tankers, the pipelines, et cetera. They, the Houthis have claimed responsibility for the, for the east-west pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's no question that the Iranians are behind this. But the Iranians so far um, seem to be taking steps that I think they, they believe are calculated to show that they, that they aren't just pushovers, but not to throw the two countries into war. But what if they misjudge? How do they know where our red lines are? 
have we really, de have we really defined them? Um, th on the nuclear, on the JCPOA, the, the nuclear agreement that Trump, from, from which the President withdrew the United States, um, even on that, where the Iranians are going to the edge and beyond the edge, what, what's the, what they're doing is reversible. So I think the Iranians are being very careful to take steps that they would see aren't throwing everything out yet. Um, but again, who knows? I also wonder what the conversations are between Mohammed bin Salman and the White House. You know, I said that the Saudis, the, the Saudis um, are opaque. We don't really know because I would be concerned that Mohammed bin Salman with this view of Saudi Arabia's strength, this view of, Saudi, of his role um, in the region, and his desire to get out from under the stench of the, of the Khashoggi murder might be egging on the White House in talking about how this could go, this could be easier than, a, a war with Iran could be easier than I think, in fact, it would, it would be. If we see what's happening in Yemen, I, I think that he, he should draw a different conclusion. Um, the, you know, the President has stated that he's, that he's willing to talk to the Iranians. The Iranians have rebuffed, have rebuffed that, um, and I don't see them changing that position. No matter how bad the sanctions are, I think that the that the that the how much bad how bad the sanctions are hurting. The sanctions are hurting. Um, I think that those of us that were watching, as the Trump administration was moving into these unilateral sanctions, we underestimated how much of an impact these unilateral sanctions would have. You know, I, I was part of the U.S. government when we were doing multilateral sanctions, when we were working to build a multilateral coalition on sanctions on Iran, on their various on their various trade. The sanctions that led the Iranians to agree to go into talks, the talks that led to the, the nuclear agreement. Um, we believe strongly that if you had, that you needed multilateral sanctions so that the Iranians would have few escape valves. But the Trump administration has proven that you can actually have, have the same impact or even more with unilateral sanctions if you focus on the financial, if you focus on the financial um, community because the U.S., the role of the dollar, the role of the U.S. financial system is so prevalent in the world today that you can do things that the, that the rest of the, the businesses and banks of the rest of the world will comply even if their governments haven't. So the sanctions are having an impact, but I don't see the Iranians um, crying uncle. It's, it's, not their, it's not their way. And if they were going to do talks, the very people who you'd want to talk to, like Zarif, now face the prospect of sanctions, meaning it's, meaning it's even less likely. I, I, I may have mentioned this in the lecture that you, brought, you invited me to before, I'm not sure, but as a UN official, um, I had the distinction of being the only American um, who's ever met with the Supreme Leader of Iran, um, Khamenei. I accompanied Ban Ki-moon, who was then Secretary General, to a meeting with Khamenei. And I was astonished at this three and a half, four hour monologue that, that Khamenei gave us about the United States. Here, here we were there with the Secretary General of the United Nations. Iran is a significant country in the United Nations. It, it's the, a significant country in the non-aligned movement, which is the largest single group of states in the United Nations. You'd think there'd be a big agenda the Supreme Leader would want to talk about the Secretary General. He only wanted to talk about the United States. With, um, and I sat there listening, thinking, okay, I'm sure when I was in the US government, we got a lot of things wrong about Iran as we had discussions about Iran. But we sure didn't get Iran as wrong as he's getting the United States. Um, so the, the fact that he comes from a position of such paranoia and ignorance, despite the fact that many Iranians know us, you know, many Iranians have studied here, um, scares me. Because he could very easily misinterpret um, an action that we might take, that we think is short of a declaration of war, but is actually um, and, you know, a, a, a signal or response. So I'm, I'm quite worried about the situation. Yeah, and um, so uh, I, I think most of us agree with Jeff that, that uh, they weren't, the Iranians were not going to cave. They weren't just going to say, okay, the pressure's too much, let's go to the table. But there is a cry for help quality to their attacks, if you can call them that, uh, a cry for help in the attacks on the tankers uh, in that they want outside intervention that will uh, help them get out from under sanctions. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and there was an interesting dinner last night because there was one table that just by happenstance had a lot of the Iran experts there. 
and they, and one they, of one of our moving herds. One of our <laughs> colleagues got up got up and said that they'd had this discussion at their table, and there were six people there, and five of the people thought that this could provide a diplomatic opening, that it was a cry for help, that the Trump administration could take advantage of this, that there could be talks between intermediaries or anyway, it could move in a positive direction, and there was one person who didn't agree for a reason that I'll be pretty candid about. He didn't think, even if the Iranians did want that, that the Trump administration could put together a sufficiently sophisticated plan to do it. It wouldn't be that they didn't want to. It would be simply they didn't have the capacity to carry it out. So I don't know. This is a really tough issue. And, and we had at this conference, uh, I would say, one of the countries, perhaps these country, greatest expert on Iran, Suzanne Maloney. And, it's very hard to answer these questions because, again, what goes on in Iran and in the minds of these leaders is simply unknown to us, I think. And there's, and there's, no, there's no sign of any diplomatic strategy. The president says he wants to talk. I believe that's probably sincere. The, secret, the president says he does, not want, he does not want war, but obviously he's ready to, obliter to obliterate the country if, if necessary. But I don't see the diplomatic strategy of if the, to, first to get the Iranians to say yes to talks, and second, um, what would you do if you were in the talks? There's, you know, there's, there's not the diplomatic playbook that, that we would normally expect. I mean, normally, uh, you would expect that, the, that all of this, this large US foreign policy, foreign policy security bureaucracy would have various scenarios. If this happens, this is what we do. If we want this to happen, these are the various ways to get it done. I don't see that happening, and that concerns yeah, me. I think most of the people who can do that kind of thinking were actually at the conference. I think that's part of the problem. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, it's really quite extraordinary. And one of the just uh, footnotes to all this was a, a recurrent theme in the conference was the hollowing out of our diplomatic uh, capacity. Um, and uh, an, what is it? Until General Abizaid went out, uh, we didn't have ambassadors. You know, you have this whole litany at, at your fingertips. We didn't have, for the whole period of the Trump administration, we didn't have an ambassador in Egypt and Jordan in UAE, in Turkey, in Qatar, or in Saudi Arabia. They've been vacant now for, for, for more than two years. So General Abizaid went out there. That was obviously the most urgent, but by, you know, Turkey and Egypt are sure pretty important too, as is Jordan. So the, the chargés, our second level, who's usually a career, almost always a career diplomat, these people are good. They know the region, but they, they don't have the clout, the diplomatic clout to go say, hey, Maybe to the young prince, let's rethink this. You know, uh, they just don't have that kind of edge. But the other thing that we did find out is that uh, no matter which country, uh, well, no matter who was doing the talking with uh, the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, uh, that intervention was less important than the call he would get that night from Jared, mm -hmm. which uh, was. Um, Perhaps not entirely new news, but uh, still has the ability to send a shiver down your spine. Um, we concluded, uh, and I want to open it up to the audience uh, very quickly, but we concluded with a session on uh, essentially political elites. How are they looking at, um, at the Gulf um, in advance of a, of a national election? And uh, tried to get uh, a sense from uh, both sides of the aisle about uh, future thinking about the Gulf, and why don't I turn it over to Jason to, to summarize that. Uh, yeah, that was an interesting conversation. You know there are a lot of vacant ambassador posts in the Gulf when there are more vacant posts than posts that Anne has held, so, which I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think it, was, it was eight to five or something. Yeah. Um, the, uh, just, just on the point about um, Iran, that there's no diplomatic uh, strategy to get them to the table, I mean, that presumes that's the goal of the administration. And while Trump has said that, I think we also heard many people who thought that the people around him, particularly the National Security Advisor, has publicly said for quite a long time, the goal is different. The goal is to cause a collapse of the regime, whatever, whatever that means. And I think the idea that what Iran is doing now is motivated by figuring out how to show its unhappiness without triggering something larger is part of it. I think the other part is just to show that, like, the status quo isn't okay from their standpoint. They don't want to let some some situ like situation could just develop where they're exporting two or three hundred thousand barrels a day, and that's just not sustainable for them. So they have to change the reality of that they face right now, and I think that's why we see them starting to lash out with strikes in the Strait of Hormuz and other things through maybe through proxies. Um, 
what I, I think what's imp one of the things we talked about was the extent to what what would happen. How are Democrats thinking about about this? Where's the where's the Republicans on the Hill, which is not the same as necessarily the Republicans in the White House, and how much that, in my view, has changed. And we heard that from other people too, given what we've seen in the last um, year or two. The the there's been a I think Democrat. What we heard uh, is that Democrats uh, have a view that Saudi, in particular, has um, spent a lot of time trashing President Obama and then had a rather public embrace of President Trump in a way that uh, rubs some um, Democrats the wrong way. I think it actually is th the opposite of that is true as well. That actually the way in which this administration has has embraced the kingdom, and in, in almost like a nakedly transactional way, will look beyond whatever bad deeds may have been done because we want investment, we need oil. Um, it, what the consequence of that is that it's politicized the U.S. Saudi relationship in in a way that I think is beyond what we've seen uh, before. There have been concerns. Um, with Democrats on both sides of the aisle, but with Democrats, you know, for a while, but they have always been a little bit muted um, ever since the Ibn Saud FDR sat on the Quincy <coughs> and sort of solidified the oil for security relationship. But it is going to be much harder for a Democrat coming into the White House to um, go and visit and spend time with, with, with the crown prince and to uh, embrace the kingdom, just given where this political... Uh, dynamic is now, and I think Dems we heard will be more likely to rethink the relationship. Generally, are rethinking the U.S. role in the Middle East, and whether a lot of that has may have done more more harm than good. And then we talked about what they would do with the Iran deal, and is it actually a plausible scenario that the position of the Democratic administration would be? We just want to get back to where things were. How do we re-enter the deal and get Iran to comply again? at a point that may well likely be two years from now where they are in formal violation of the deal, have restarted an enrichment program, they will soon pass their stock levels for low enriched uranium, they may do something with 20% uh, enrichment threshold. So, and, and that's gonna cause the Europeans to condemn Iran. It's gonna be harder to walk that uh, back. And there was a sense that you know the U.S. would have to get some version of the JCPOA plus some other concessions, and then a view from oh. someone that that's actually going to be pretty hard because the Iranians are going to say, "Wait, it should be the other way around. Like we need to be, we need recompense for the fact that we were complying, and then we had to deal with the sanctions for a couple of years. Um, so we're not ready to give more than we otherwise would." So there was some discussion about how viable it was to re-enter the deal and how quickly that could happen, even if the Democrats uh, wanted to. Okay, we've gabbed long enough. Uh, questions? Right. Lots. Can you just wait for the microphone? Yeah, there we sorry. go. I'd like to ask an uplifting and, uh, question. So there is a nascent effort in the Islamic world in an organization called the OIC, I think. The organization, okay. Who are working with BRICS Plus to create a genuine Islamic commercial union. So my question is, is this genuine, or is it just a lot of smoke and mirrors? Okay. Sir, I, I'm not familiar with the initiative. My guess is it's smoke and mirrors. The OIC has a very weak capacity, um, A. And B, the OIC itself is, is riven by these differences that we were describing in the Gulf. There's, this, there's the Sunni-Shia split within the OIC, but more important, there's the... There, what? Yeah, there's the, there's the, there's the Saudi um, Qatar fight. There's the GCC fight. The OIC is dominated by Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia will um, more or less set the OIC agenda. It's not going to be followed by those parts of the Islamic world that don't appreciate Saudi's leadership. So I, I wouldn't think it's If that Jeff important. doesn't know about it, it's probably not that substantive. <laughs> yeah. Could we hear the very short version of the three to four hour rant of misunderstanding of the United States by uh, Iran? Uh, how do they misunderstand us and what mistakes is that likely to cause? Um, I, the misunderstanding, I don't think, I don't think um, covers everybody. 
I think Jawad Zarif, the foreign minister, understands this very well. I think that 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 there's an Iran, there's a generation of Iranian leaders, you know, sort of sort of my age, uh, my age and older, who studied here, who somehow um, absorbed the U.S. education that they that they got or or U.S. ties that they had, and, and they probably understand this pretty well. In my in my UN capacity, I, I traveled to Tehran fairly frequently and met with Iranian officials who I think had a pretty good understanding. The problem is that while Iran's not a monolith, the, the Iranian government is not, is not monolithic. There are various power centers inside the, inside the Iranian government. The ultimate decision maker is the supreme leader. He has absolutely no understanding of the United States. At least that's, at least that's my impression from this unique Meeting I meeting I attended, and I have no reason to I have no reason to doubt it. There were, when I was in the when I was in the U.S. government, we we had lots of we tried to gather as much intelligence as we could, obviously on the, what the supreme leader was thinking, and there was nothing that he said in that meeting that defied my own understanding of his background based on the intelligence I had I had seen as a U.S. official. He simply sees the U.S. as an implacable foe of Iran, um, of of the huddled masses of the world, you know that that the that the U.S. He, it's 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 this um, it's like a, it's, he had this cartoonish vision of this of this um, capitalist, um, bloodthirsty Washington regime that was out to just excuse my language screw the world, and Iran in Iran in particular, and he had lots of he had lots of examples. Um, he used the the uh, lots of examples of, of the of why the U.S. was basically the source of all evil in the country, but moreover, why the U.S. was about to collapse. That was what really struck me. He get he, there he was talking to the Secretary General of the United Nations about the signs of ultimate collapse of the United States, and his example was um, Occupy Wall Street. Now, Occupy Wall Street was a very interesting phenomenon, but it was already over. Months over by the time that we by the time that we had this meeting with with Khamenei, and I don't think any of us thought that Occupy Wall Street really endangered the American way of the way of life the way that Khamenei did, and I have to imagine that he he believed this because why else would he have gone to such effort to explain it? So it was a combination of of misunderstanding about um, our role in the world, misunderstanding about our intentions in the world. Um, and, and misunderstandings about the direction the country was taking. I was just struck by this. And, and it also taught me something about, about Iran's leadership structures. Because if you have so many sophisticated Iranians in the country who have a pretty good understanding of us, why is it that it doesn't penetrate his, his own thinking? Is it that they don't tell him? He doesn't listen? He doesn't want to know? Or he, or he rejects it? I don't know. Too late to get him a Fulbright, huh? <laughs> uh, next question. Yes, in the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and I think you mentioned about the importance of the shipping lanes. So how do you, um, and maybe it's impossible to determine Trump's, Trump's tweets, but the one that he did re uh, just the other day about um, <clears throat> let China and Japan worry about their own ships unless we're going to get paid for it. Are you aware of that? Yes, he's had several of those tweets, right. What similar tweets. Now, you know, it makes me always wonder about unintended consequences. Are we really want to make China's naval fleet more, va more important than what it currently is by backing off from the shipping lanes? No, I, I have to think, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, that this is just bluster on the part of the president. And, and of course, the Gulf countries don't want the Chinese Navy in there either uh, because the Americans play straight with them. And, and in fairness to the Gulf countries, they finance many of our bases in the region or a good percentage of them. So I have to think the president was just blowing off steam on that. Uh, there is no one else, as a practical matter, who can basically protect those shipping lanes, which are so vital to commerce. <clears throat> They're vital to Egypt, too. They're vital, the Suez Canal and all the commercial traffic. It's not just oil and gas that transits that. And it's, and it's valuable to East Asia. You know, India's on the verge of being the most populous country on the planet. All those shipping lanes have to be protected by the U.S. Navy. And I know it costs us money. But after all, we are 
we are a superpower, and it is our international responsibility. So I, I, I didn't take that seriously, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I think he takes it seriously, though. Um, you know, this theme of having others foot the bill is just, uh, you know, chronic with him. And I am sure that that tweet caused a few heart tremors in, in the Gulf. Right. Like, what the hell have we gotten ourselves into? Although, although Dan, as we talked about in this conference, um, it's not unique to this administration to have a tin cup exercise. No, no. You know, and that, we, that we have got yeah. that... that that all of us who have worked in these positions have had to go to these countries and hold out a tin cup for this or that. Ex that ex we, they we, may have been taken to extremes this time because yeah. usually we're putting some money into the into the initiative and trying to get others to put more in. Where now I think it's just they're trying to get the others to pay for it entirely. Yeah, we usually dropped a paper on them too um, when we were asking for money as opposed to a tweet. Uh, you know, it's a little different sort of thing. But anyway, just in the back. Doctor, welcome back. Thank you. In the past year, we've seen some overtures uh, between the UAE and Saudi Arabia with Israel. There have been some diplomats going both directions, I think. Uh, at the same time, Qatar continues to support Hamas. I'm wondering if any of the panelists can comment about sort of the, the alliance between some of the Gulf countries and Israel, these, <coughs> Iran, and how that split with Israel is kind of playing out. That one has your name all over. So, so um, the Saudis have been reaching out, and the Emirates really for years to Israel, and there have been a lot of low-level contacts for a very long time. I think the the Saudi the relationship between the Saudis and Israel now is much more high profile. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu was uh, got a lot of uh, publicity and, frankly, a lot of domestic credit out of his trip to Oman. Uh, so, so I think relations between the Saudis and the, the Israelis are a lot better. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out in things like this Bahrain conference and support for the Palestinians. Qatar gives $300 million a year to Gaza. Every last dime goes through the Israelis, and every shovel of dirt goes through the Israelis. The Israelis don't like to talk about it very much, but they're very happy to have this cash going into Gaza to stabilize the situation because the living conditions there are so rotten. And the Qataris have also had contacts with the Israelis yeah. on and off over many years. Yeah, they were the first. Uh, they opened a trade office, but it collapsed during the second intifada. So again, uh, and, and the Egyptians, God knows, I walked into the Egyptian intelligence one time, and there is the Mossad liaison officer. They've had they've had excellent contacts at the intelligence and military level. Of course, they have a peace treaty for decades that really ha haven't spilled over into the general population. No, because there's no money behind it. Quite apart from the political implications, it's fifty billion dollars. But it was it was it was mute on who was going to pay for it. I mean, the I think that many administrations have tried to grapple with the economic side, the the so-called peace dividends, the economic side of of any kind of Arab-Israeli um, peaceful coexistence. And so, you, so you saw under the you saw under the Clinton administration, you saw under the George W. Bush administration, you saw under the Obama administration, you saw Kerry really working on the economic aspects of what a Middle East peace would look like. The difference this time, and I mean, and I think it's legitimate to talk about what would be the economic um, benefits to all the people of the region if you had a more if you had peace. I think that's a legitimate topic. But the difference between what Clinton, um, Bush. Obama did was they also had some pol they also had some political skin in the game and some U.S. financial skin in the game. So far, the Bahrain documents show no U.S. political skin in the game and no U.S. financial skin in the game. So that's different. And if I can add, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, under earlier versions, uh, the idea was uh, that the U.S. was going to pay a lot of money to upgrade Israel's defense capability so that it would feel secure if it made peace. Yeah. And there was also an expectation that not just uh, wealthy Gulf nations, but also the Europeans would do a lot to support uh, the Palestinians as they got their economy going. The Gulf Arabs have not always been terribly reliable when it comes to supporting Palestinians and or, or many other uh, uh, philanthropic uh, uh, sorts of activities, uh, whereas the Europeans, you know, if they commit, they, they commit. And so it seems to me like this is an awfully hopeful 
approach and without a political perspective, you know, something less than hopeful. I'm sorry, that's right. Back uh, to you. Thank you. So my question is a two-parter. It's um, how winnable is a war with Iran? And especially given that last question, what sort of role do our allies play, particularly Saudi Arabia and Israel, in any conflict like that, if that were to happen? Um. We'll all take a chop at that one. Go ahead. Uh, not very winnable at all. Uh, and, and if you're going after the nuclear, Jason would know better than I, I think there was discussion that we, if, I think there was always a question about whether we have the capacity to hit those deeply embedded nuclear facilities, but I'm not sure. But, but it's, it's um, what, four times the size of Iraq, Jason? Uh, yeah. Military it's got a it was sophisticated it's big it's army air defense system as well, so it, it wouldn't be cost free. And what could we expect of our allies and the Saudis? Not much. Their military is, is for all the money that they've spent, uh, has shown itself in Yemen to be an utter paper tiger. They can't even defend their border against a bunch of, of uh, uh, you know, ha a bunch of insurgents, ill trained and ill equipped insurgents. Uh, and and what the uh, Israelis will do? That's a really good question. But but keep in mind, we went through this, or certainly the bluster and the threats a few years back, six seven years back. You were the assistant secretary, and um, the Israelis, uh, at least at that point, made a lot of noise, mostly to have the U.S. take more aggressive action. Uh, against Iran, I think. I think the Israelis will have to be dealing with Lebanon. If there's a war, if there's a war with the with Iran, there's going to be a war between Lebanon and Israel because Iran will use Hezbollah um, with 120,000 rockets. So I think the Israelis will be rather distracted. Let me give a slightly different take on it. I would say that there's no question that we are vastly more powerful than Iran, and in a, a total war we would obliterate the Iranian uh, military. But we would have to occupy Iran, and I don't think we want to do that. It's a pretty unpopular notion in the American public for good reason. I think that the military view is that we could take out their um, nuclear facilities, but it would take a lot of waves of sorties, and that if we did not occupy Iran, that the Iranians could reconstruct their program in a couple of years. So there are not a lot of um, you know, lanes in which we could get the kind of military action that you know, we might be satisfied with. And um, in terms of you know, some kind of intermediate <clears throat> conflict, I think of the kind Anne was discussing, they're, they're not really good outcomes. Uh, and then there's the money. Yeah, and these things, you know, we're going to be paying for the uh, for the Iraq War, you know, until you have grandkids. So, um, this will be and this will be harder. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to see everything through the lens of energy, although that's kind of my role sitting around tables like this. But um, this president doesn't seem to like high gasoline prices. And if you want to see gasoline prices go through the roof for a sustained period of time, have a military confrontation with Iran and see how Iran responds to that and the kind of targets in the region that they're going to hit. Mr. Robinchain. Uh, this question for Jason. Um, be interested in your comments on, on the long-term sustainability of U.S. oil and gas production. I mean, there's some feeling that the, with fracking, the productivity is high at the beginning but drops off very quickly in yeah. these wells. And what is... What, what is your long-term view of the sustainable nature of this of this uh, production? Yeah, it's a really good question and, and an important one because I think we tend to sort of make policy and sell things like strategic assets we've had for a half century like this, <coughs> the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because of the reality today and not necessarily think that that reality may look different in 10 years. Um, the answer to your question is I, I think anyone, particularly an academic, but um, but but anyone should answer it with um, a grain of salt because there's a huge amount of uncertainty. The Shell Revolution is still relatively new, still in relatively um, relatively early innings, uh, and and everything we know about it to date 
suggest, um, you know, we've underestimated it. I mean, the idea that we've seen this constant tension between the technology and the productivity improving, and yet the decline rates, which are very steep, and the resource base, you know, eventually you drill out to worse and worse uh, source rock, uh, but the technology and productivity has been winning as well as the ability of companies which are not generating positive cash flow to continue to finance their investments by going into the debt and equity markets. And you're starting to see that change a little bit. You know, we, there was a good article in the Wall Street Journal, I think, in the last day or two about Pioneer, which is a leading oil company in the Permian, which has reduced its production targets and is trying to generate more cash flow and dividends for its investors. Um, can we continue to grow at one and a half million barrels a day year after year after year? Probably not. The pace of that growth is going to slow early next decade, middle next decade, but we'll get to a pretty high number. And then after that, it'll slow and it'll start to plateau. And I think we'll be able to sustain, you know, somewhere higher than we are today uh, for, for a long time to come. So we're not going to continue to see these huge growth rates, but we're going to be the largest oil producer in the world for, for a while. Back there? <coughs> no, you're next. <laughs> I share the concern that several of the panelists have mentioned about the possibility of war. And my question is, what does the polling say about what the American public thinks of that? And I have seen some essays by commentators outside the U.S. suggesting that when an election is coming up, sometimes a war can be very helpful to the incumbent. Um, so. Do you see any signs of that? The third part of my question is, what is the Defense Department doing? We've certainly heard that they're opposed to a war, but what can they do in this situation? If Trump didn't want a war with Iran, why did he appoint Bolton? <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's one of those tough lessons of life not to apply too much logic to situations that don't admit of much logic. I have no idea why he... Uh, <laughs> he saw him on Fox. You know, it, it, everyone's asking that question, why did he appoint Bolton? I'm going to let the experts answer the other questions. So, so on the on the military, and what can the Defense Department do? Obviously, they follow orders from the commander in chief, but as a practical matter, there's a lot they can do. Uh, and and to, and I suspect General Dunford, because much of this was in the press in about five minutes, how General Dunford tried to dissuade the president uh, on just the grounds we've been discussing that that you get on an escalation ladder. You, you don't know where it goes. They begin to retaliate. This is the other danger. They begin to retaliate against our bases in the Gulf, so they hit our allies in the shipping lanes. Uh, and as a practical matter, the options that the DOD, and I've seen this many times over the years, would put together before the president would, uh, would reflect their view of the situation. Uh, in other words, the Joint Chiefs are very experienced bureaucratic players as, very, as well as very experienced soldiers and airmen and sailors. So, so uh, they, would, they would give the president a range of options that, that uh, reflected their views or reinforced their views. And on the polling, we had an interesting thing in this conference that, that 70, what was the figure that we used from one of our participants, something like 75% uh, uh, of, of Republicans were opposed to a war and, and a much lower percentage of Democrats, right? Well, it, uh, was the that actual right? question was, um, supported the president's decision not to attack. attack. And uh, I guess there's a, a polling phenomenon where if you put the name Trump into a question, the Democrats are likely to... Um, <laughs> Oppose, uh, oppose it. <laughs> um, and, but in fact, I think more Democrats would like to avoid uh, a, a conflict uh, in the Gulf. Just to, um, just to illustrate um, Anne's point about uh, DOD's ability to um, forestall uh, engagements it doesn't want to be in. So th this is a little different because it's on the front pages every day, and the president uh, is enjoying, you know, turning the wheels and the pulleys and all the rest. But uh, in 1999, the White House, uh, the Clinton White House, asked uh, the Joint Chiefs for options for um, uh, going into Afghanistan after Bin Laden, and uh, this was after we had had two embassies blown up. 
and the Joint Chiefs, uh, they just uh, they didn't want to have any part of it. And they basically told him it would take two divisions and several carrier groups and so on. And it was, you know, ridiculous price tag. And so the president stood down. I mean, he just couldn't get DOD to do what he wanted. And this was in the middle of impeachment. And so there was no, you know, ability to go to the American people really and say, we really need to do this. I know you don't understand this threat yet, but we need to nip it in the bud. So DOD can be pretty um, effective when it wants to be. But this is a really tough one because the, you know, the Iranians have now attacked tankers and, um, and, and our $131 million drone, which shouldn't be forgotten in all this. <laughs> How do you build a $131 million drone? This is for Ambassador Patterson, please. Uh, you had mentioned um, the getting our resources out of the Gulf. Could you expand on that? Our resources? You know, uh, the pivot to the east. Oh, the pivot, the pivot, yes, the pivot to great power constant. So the national defense strategy came out, and I was on a review panel congressionally appointed to review it. The national defense strategy says we need to basically reduce our presence and our, and our money and the amount we're spending in the Gulf and concentrate on China and Russia. And, and the, the committee, the review committee, endorsed that wholeheartedly. If, and if anything, was, was the more we got into this issue of China and our inadequate response to Chinese aggression uh, in, in equipment like submarines and transport aircraft, uh, and then what the Russians, the resurgent Russia, that yes, absolutely, we need to focus on great power competition and what sequestration had done to our military capacity, the automatic budget cuts had done to our military capacity. But there is doubt about whether we can get out of the Middle East, you know, the $130 million drone dropping a million dollar missile on a truck full of, of jihadists. But we do need to cut that back because it wasn't just the money and the equipment. It was the sort of the, the different mindset of, of, you've had a whole generation of, of military personnel that have been in those wars, and they need to focus on an entirely different type of conflict now, which means entirely different training and, and military education. In the back. Um. What is the relative importance of the uh, Gulf Iranian tensions to the overall regional tensions? So as to say, even if we were to assume a best case scenario between the US and Iran, reducing tensions, possibly reaching a new deal, would that really um, improve regional tensions that much? Or are we just stuck with this kind of rivalry for the foreseeable future? Yeah, you know, th we talked about this in the in the, the last couple of days. And I think that the, the basic consensus, and I defer to the others, is that um, while we in the United States look at the Saudi Iranian or U.S. Iranian or Sunni Shia tensions as being the predominant um, problem, the predominant difference in the region, it's actually the the problems inside the Sunni world that's 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 going to be longer lasting. It's more that's more significant. Um, the this problem of of what of the Saudi, Emirati, Egyptian um, fear of political Islam, Muslim Brotherhood that that this differences inside inside the Sunni world is a bigger rift, or a harder to manage rift I should say maybe not bigger rift a harder to manage rift than the than the Saudi Iranian rift I mean there have, Saudi and Iran historically have have been able to manage. The, the rivalries across the across the Gulf, but can the Sunni world manage these rivalries between the between the, the different visions of what Islam means in, means in politics? I think that was the sort of conclusion we all had that we're un, that we're that we're underestimating the rift inside the Sunni world, which is independent of the competition between Saudi and Iran or U.S. and Iran. But it is also entirely possible that the United States. Um, as we did with the nuclear accord, could come to some understanding with Iran. I think Bolton and Pompeo would have to be sidelined, but that we would come to some understanding with Iran, some agreement with Iran that we would find satisfactory that would not 
uh, deal with the anxieties of uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis. I mean, the Emiratis, of course, are really on the uh, in a particularly difficult position because, on the one hand, they they're fiercely anti-Iranian. At the same time, they're terribly worried about a war because they're the ones most likely to get whacked. Um, you know, Dubai and Abu Dhabi were, are pretty tempting targets. So. I guess the, the, the point is um, there are endless permutations for uh, different kinds of dissatisfaction in the region. Uh, and just getting back to sort of normal, acceptable dissatisfaction is going to be a Herculean task. Other questions? Yes. I'm sorry. If you see that if there is a conflict between the United States and the Arab uh, the Persian Gulf, do you see Israel would join in, or would he sit out, or what? What do you think Israel would? What part would they play? My own view. I, my own view is that the is that the Israelis generally want us to be as tough as possible with Iran, but that but the Israelis are hesitant about actual war. I think this is different than than might have than might have been a few years a few years back. Um, and I think in terms of, of Iran, if Iran feels that the war is really going, is really an existential issue, if they're really being pressured, they're going to unleash Hezbollah against Israel. And Hezbollah is far stronger than Hezbollah was in that 2006 war. I was, I was US ambassador in Lebanon in 2006, and I have lots of stories about that 33-day about that war um, and the economic blockade afterwards. But I, I think that, that Israel would be hesitant, Israel would be hesitant to take a position that would lead to Hezbollah unleashing its barrage of rockets. Israel can destroy Lebanon. Without question, Israel can respond. Israel, but the pain to Israel would be really great if, he, if Israel does something that would, lead, that would lead Hezbollah to unleash its rockets. But Israel is stronger than Hezbollah. Israel is stronger than Hezbollah, without question. Israel can destroy Lebanon from top to bottom. Um, but Israel's going to suffer in the process. I'll just make a quick... This actually didn't come up in our conference, and I kind of, in retrospect, wish it had. When we think about how this might play out, any sort of conflict, uh, we shouldn't forget Iran's cyber capabilities. Yeah. And if Iran is trying to remind everyone that it has the ability to impose pain on them and the status quo is not sustainable, I think that's important. Yes, and they took down Aramco a few years yeah. ago, so they, yeah. they know what they're doing. Okay. Um, all right. We have one last question. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we're all members of the panel are, are uh, oh, thank you. Uh, certain that the provocations in the Gulf, the attacks on the freighters, and and uh, are actually attributable to Iran. Is there any doubt that that might not be true? So it's an excellent question, and in fact. In a conversation a week or so ago, I said to Anne, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if these were false flag operations. And um, I'm not going to characterize her response. I'll let her divulge that if she wishes to. Um, but let's just say she didn't dismiss it out of hand. Um, however, uh, in the aftermath, the, um, the, <coughs> the intelligence community has briefed enough people who are credible, um, who have said there's no question Iran did this. You know, uh, Adam Schiff uh, was uh, one of them, the chairman, Democratic chairman of the House Intelligence uh, Committee, and a number of others um, who uh, are perhaps less known but are influential people in the community. And I, th the understanding is that Iran did this. I personally thought it was crazy. I thought, you know, the Iranians were actually getting someplace with their gradual walk towards breaking out of the nuclear deal and that they didn't need to do multiple different uh, provocations at once, but uh, it seems like everyone is convinced, and who am I not to go with the crowd? So anyway, on that note, I really want to thank my panelists and all the other members uh, of, the, uh, of the seminar who were here and uh, the symposium. Uh, it was a great event. We will try to turn it into something intelligible in print. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming today on a late June day. Thank you.